Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, I'm going to begin chapter 25 tonight. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies of Proverbs, uh, they're all uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I hope you will go back and watch this all from the beginning. Uh, now, I am a KJV firstist. Uh, Brother Joe Byron coined that term. So I, I look at the KJV first, uh, but I'm not against looking at other translations if it uh, could be helpful. So I'm going to use the Amplified Translation as a, as a backup. I'll be going back and forth between the two of them. So beginning with uh, chapter 25, verse 1, let me begin. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that's very interesting that uh, this would cite that uh, uh, in the way it's stated that these are also Proverbs of Solomon. So uh, not to be confused with this could be uh, writings by somebody else. Now, I, I believe uh, I have heard that some people believe that uh, some of the Proverbs were written by somebody else. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's true. Um, I know that some of the Psalms were not written by King David. Most of them were. Uh, but so this is telling us, and let me read that in the Amplified. These are also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So this is interesting because this, this particular chapter here is already a copy from not, not the original. So whatever Solomon had originally written down, uh, we're getting this uh, uh, from a copy of the original. I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. And then it says in verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. <laughs> I, I would say not just the, the glory of kings to search out a matter. Let's see, that's what I'm, I'm doing right now. I, I'm searching out the matter of these scriptures, uh, attempting to understand it all. And uh, it is glorious. Okay. There is so much concealed in the scriptures. Uh, I've, I've been uh, saved now for 29 years and been studying the Bible consistently all, all those years. Um, I've read these books over and over again many times, and yet sometimes it's the second time or the fifth time or the tenth time you, that you read it before you get it. All of a sudden you get an epiphany. Uh, or maybe I should say a revelation. God reveals what was hidden to you, and you get it. And that's exciting. That's, I really, really enjoy that. When oh, you finally understand something, and or you see something in it you just didn't see before. Sometimes that comes, I believe, because of the, the, the Holy Spirit revealing it to, to a believer. But also sometimes it comes by... Uh, uh, you know, in a, in a discussion with the brethren as we study together and uh, and we share our insights. And uh, so I'm, I learned by studying the scriptures and I learned by discussing the scriptures with others. But it is exciting to understand the things that God's concealed. Uh, it's like a, a treasure hunt. We're, we're, we're searching the scriptures for the treasures that are in there. There's, some of it's hidden and concealed and you got to dig and dig and then you find a, a nugget. Let me go on to verse three in the KJV. The, the heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. The heaven for height. I think this is continuing on with the same thought about things being hidden. Uh, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. And then it says the heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. 
Let me look at that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the hearts and minds of kings are unsearchable. Okay, so it's just expressing the fact that uh, uh, knowing what kings are thinking and their true feelings uh, is, is pretty difficult. Uh, maybe a king will, will share, if you're fortunate enough to be in the inner circle around a king, uh, or if it's not a king, let's say it's a very prominent person. Let's say it's a, a government official or a very wealthy person or a very prominent, uh, you know, a church member. Uh, and uh, you're, you're close to them. And knowing what they're really thinking when they share their innermost thoughts with you. You know, I've, I try to be pretty open on these broadcasts and tell you what I'm really thinking all the time. And... Uh, uh, but that there, there are some private conversations I've had many times over the years with uh, other believers. And so some of the people who've gotten closer to me, I've, I've kind of bared my soul more to them than I do necessarily in public. So, uh, yeah, it's not everybody is going to really know what a person really thinks or their real, real feelings about something necessarily until you get real close to them. And it says, verse 4, take away the dross, dross, D-R-O-S-S, take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the wicked from the, before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. So I think this is like an analogous, the um, verse 4 is analogous to verse 5, but let me read that in the Amplified. Take away the dross from the silver. I don't know what dross is. I'm assuming maybe it's the, it's either the, the, uh, the shine of the silver, the, the the beauty of the silver because it's getting it's gotten dusty or, or corroded or, uh, or maybe you've it was corroded and dusty and you cleaned it up and now you see the shine. But I, I don't want to bother looking up dross right now. But you see, if you take this away from the silver, there comes out the pure metal for a vessel for the silversmith to shape. Okay, so the dross, I guess, would be the impurities. That's like if you're refining the silver, you, uh, you know, the impurities get melted away and you separate the pure silver from the uh, impurities. It says, and there comes out the pure metal for a vessel for the silversmith to shape. Uh, then in verse five, it says, take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. So this is saying in verse 5 in the Amplified, it says, it, let me read it again in the KJV, take away the wicked from before the king. Now see, from before the king is really key here because when I read it initially, I thought it was taken away the wicked from the king. In other words, any wickedness in the king's heart, uh, you take that away and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Now that to me makes sense, but it's also, but but it says, take away the wicked from before the king. And in verse, in the Amplified, it says, take away the wicked from before the king. So there's no change there. But I saw, I think when you consider how it's phrased, it's taking away the wicked from before the king means the wicked people around the king. If you get the wicked people out of his court, out of his, his advisors and stuff, then his throne will be established in righteousness. Uh, verse 6 in the KJV. It says, um, Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For it is, uh, for better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the point that uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a gospel account, one of them, uh, I, think, I think it's Jesus saying that uh, rather than uh, taking the front seat in the congregation, uh, like a seat of honor, Instead of trying to take that and being told to, oh, that's reserved for someone else. You must leave. That would be, you'd be embarrassed. 
But if you don't take it and they invite you to come forward unto it, then it's your, it's turned out to be an honor. But don't try to take the, the seat and then be humiliated when they tell you that's not for you. I, that's the, I don't remember exactly how it's phrased, but I think Jesus made this same point here in one of the gospel accounts. Let me read this in the Amplified. It says, um, do not be boastfully ambitious and claim honor in the presence of the king. and Do not stand in the place of great men. For it, it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. So let's all be careful. See, what we're trying to do here with the Proverbs, you know, the, it's said over and over again that, King Solomon wrote these proverbs down uh, so in, in order for his son to, to learn um, wisdom. And uh, we're reading them. They're, they're here for our benefit now so that we can learn wisdom. Um, and, and there's a difference between knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. These words are used throughout the book of Proverbs, but I think there's an important distinction in these three words. Take the scriptures. If, uh, if I ask you, well, what does Romans 6.23 say? And you say, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, so... You would show me there that you have knowledge. You know about the verse. You know what it says. But then I would ask you to ask, well, can you explain it to me? What does it mean? And if you don't understand, even though you know the verse, do you understand it? Do you know the true meaning of it? That's, see, knowledge, understanding is a step above knowledge. And then finally, wisdom is being able to apply knowledge and understanding. Okay, now that you know the verse and you understand it, will you apply that to your life? And that's what we want to do here with this verse in Proverbs. Let's not try to take the prestigious place initially. It's better to hold back and, and maybe they'll invite us up to the front rather than trying to take it for ourselves and then being humiliated and asked to, to, to go to the back of the room. Um, Verse 8 uh, in the KJV, Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. I think verse 9 might be connected. Uh, Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thine infamy turn not away. Well, I, I, I can't claim to understand that initially, initial reading, so let me look at it in the Amplified. Verse 8, 9, and 10. It says, Do not rush out to argue your case before magistrates or judges. In other words, don't, don't be anxious to go to court. Uh, otherwise, what will you do in the end? when your case is lost and when your neighbor, your opponent humiliates you. <laughs> so be careful. Don't just jump into like suing people or take them to the court. Uh, be very, very careful. Give it a lot of thought before you jump. Don't jump into something like that. In verse nine, he says, argue your case with your neighbor himself before you go to court. Yeah. Uh, it's not only arguing with, uh, on a legal matter, an illegal dispute, but I, this is also important just in protocol for uh, believers to you know, how we deal with each other. Uh, I have a video titled Protocol, and there's I, I explain how there are some people that did not follow proper protocol when they had an issue with me, and we had a relationship, uh, a close friendship for a long time, and when an issue arose, the proper protocol is to go directly to your brother and talk to him about it. Explain your concerns. 
and love and, and uh, see if you can't work it out. Uh, and that's the same, rather than going and talking behind their person's back and trying to, and then leaving and making a judgment without even approaching, approaching the, uh, the person. And that, that, that's how I'm applying this in the church. But in legal matters, it's saying before you get so quick to take someone to court, just try to work it out with them outside of the court. Go directly to them and see if you come to some kind of a amiable agreement. I don't know if it's amiable or amicable. I have to look those words up here. Um, uh, argue your case with your neighbor himself before you go to court and do not reveal another secret or he who hears it will shame you and the rumor about you and your action in court will have no end. <laughs> do not reveal another secret. Yeah, I think that was, we could apply that broader than just in a courtroom, that, that we could apply that broadly in life as a whole, especially in the church among believers. Uh, I've had people share things with me privately and they then they'll say, well, this is only for us. Please don't repeat what I said because they're, they're confiding in me personally, and I've and I've confided in other people personally, and then if someone does betray that trust, then uh, it is a shameful thing when when you realize that someone is, you know, they can't keep their mouth shut, and you've said something in confidence, and they're repeating it now. Everybody knows, and you didn't intend for everybody to know, and now you know you can no longer trust that person. They're not trustworthy. So let's be careful before we start repeating, repeating things that we're told in confidence. Um, verse 11 in the KJV says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Hmm, that's a beautiful concept. Apples of gold in pictures of silver. Uh, a, that's a word fitly spoken. Um, as an ear ring of gold or, and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Well, I don't know if these two ideas are turned together. I think they're, I mean, really run together, but they, uh, they certainly are even separately. They're, I think, worthy, worthy ideals. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Let me read that in the Amplified. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken at the right time. Yeah, spoken at the right time. See, I was thinking in terms of uh, fitly spoken means just well spoken. You're articulate. You have, you have a good vocabulary. You have the ability to communicate and, and uh, you're cohesive and and coherence in the, uh, particular that would that's what I'm thinking about fitly spoken but this is telling us no it's a uh, it, a word spoken at the right time <clears throat> now if we <clears throat> if we look at it from that perspective then uh, The example I'm thinking of is is when someone is uh, maybe needs some help. You can see that they're off track, and uh, maybe if your relationship is close enough, then you feel free to say, "This is what I think you should do." Of course, again, another concept is um, when we offer constructive criticism, it can be construed as um, um, how does that go again uh, no when we <laughs> we offer advice well without being asked it, it could be taken as offense as criticism uh, so we have to really be sensitive and, and some people if you have a relationship where you know that they are anxious to hear your opinion, they want your opinion, 
Uh, other than that, you should probably wait before you start advising people. Wait till they ask for your opinion. Uh, but if you say something at the right time, sometimes it's what you don't say at the right time. Right there, there are times where I've I know people where they're heartbroken. Let's say they uh, they lost their loved one. And you see them, and that right after they've lost their loved one. I mean, we could try to say something clever or something beautiful and cite some scripture. But probably they would feel better if you said nothing and just hugged them and wept along with them. The Bible does tell us to, to weep with those people who are grieving. So sometimes it's not at the right time it is to say nothing. But sometimes the right time, if you know what to say at the right time, it says it's like, how is it phrased? Uh, it's like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold. Oh, no, that's uh, apples of gold in settings of silver. So it's wonderful if you know, if you do say the right thing at the right time. And then verse 12 says, like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to an ear that listens and learns. Okay, there's, there's several elements to this and they've all got to be in place or there's a big, uh, you know, it, it can explode into a big problem. Um, one is you've got to be a wise reprover. So I would be very careful about reproving others unless you are sure you're on solid ground. If you know your scriptures and you know that the scriptures are clear about something and you need to show, show them in the scriptures and correct them and say, I, I, I want you to consider this. Look what the scriptures say. But you better be wise before you. I, I see that big, one of the big faults I see, especially in some of the, the young believers, not that because I'm 65 years old and going gray now that and I'm so wise and I know everything, I make mistakes too. But um, I, I see this happen a lot with the young believers and it's zeal without knowledge. They, they have a lot of zeal. They really want to do something. They want to preach. They want to teach. They want to rebuke. But uh, I, I suggest they slow down, study and learn. Stop talk. Don't worry about talking so much. Just wait and listen and learn. And your time will come when you get enough knowledge, enough wisdom and experience. Then it will be your time, time to, to turn to talk. And then you'll have you'll be a wise repro reprover. See, it doesn't say. It says. A wise reprover, it doesn't just say a reprover to an ear that listens and learns. You have to be you have to be able to reprove with wisdom. And then the other part thing that's important in this is a formula here. It's the person that's listening, it says to an ear that listens and learns. Now that's kind of hard to find too. Because uh, one of the biggest flaws I, I see in, in uh, well, just I'd say people in general, this is true, but uh, it particularly bothers me in, in the church. And that is that uh, people want to spend a lot more time talking than listening. And we've, we've, we've seen verses several times now through the study in Proverbs about how wise it is to spend more time listening and less time talking. Be a good listener. Be slow to talk. It says in James, uh, be, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Um, that verse there could very easily be right in the book of Proverbs. There, there are verses like that in the book of Proverbs. Uh, but here's the important thing is if, if you want to apply this verse, then don't start reproving people unless you've got accumulated enough wisdom so you can do it correctly. And 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 then the, the person you're reproving for it to do any good, they have to be have ears and be willing to listen. 
because a lot of people, they don't listen. They don't want to hear it. Or they may be pretend to listening, but they're always thinking of their defense. Uh, one of the things that I am happy about in my life, my experience is, is over the last 29 years in my walk as a Christian is that uh, I'm happy to even boast about this. I, I have listened to a lot of people. I've been willing to listen. I want to learn what the other person thinks. I want to learn their, their doctrines, uh, all their ideas on theology. I want to learn about it. Uh, sometimes I may already know a lot about a subject, but I want to hear what they have to say. And if it's different, I want to consider it because maybe I'm wrong. But, uh, and I found because, because I've, I've kept that attitude. There have been some times where I've held a, a to a belief, and then I was persuaded by someone else that I was wrong, and I I was won over to their side. That can only happen if you are truly willing to listen. And there's a saying that I like. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but it could be. It says. Uh, regarding debating or arguing or, you know, having a discussion, comparing your ideas, it says, remember why we debate. The, uh, the only thing we have to lose are the errors that we hold. If I'm in error, I want to lose the error. <laughs> I want to be corrected. And I, I think if, if we all adopt that attitude, if I'm wrong, correct me. Let me. I'll, I'll hear you out. I'll try to be fair and listen. And I'm not going to just be listening and taking notes just to try to prove you wrong. I win an argument. I want to really consider what you have to say. Uh, so this verse is, uh, again, it says, uh, like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to an ear that listens and learns. Go to verse 13 in the KJV. Uh, as, the, as the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him. For he refreshes the soul of his masters. Huh. In the Amplified, it's, it says, like the cold of snow brought from the mountains, in the time of harvest, so as a faithful messenger to those who send him. For he refreshes the life of his masters. Uh, maybe I just don't understand uh, farming enough to, to explain this. Uh, like the cold of snow brought from the mountains in the time of harvest, why would we want a cold air or snow to come when it's time to harvest. It says, so is a faithful messenger to those who send him. A, so is a, fa a faithful messenger to those who send him. So if you send someone on a, to do a task, or to send a message for you, and he's faithful, uh, for he refreshes the life of his masters. All right. Well, maybe someone can explain that one to me. I, I really, I really can't make a lot of sense of that one. Verse thirteen. Let's go on to verse fourteen. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Well, clouds and wind without rain. Uh, see. Rain is is sometimes desirable, sometimes not. So in this verse, uh, I think it's meant to be that that the uh, it's a desirable thing uh, that you want the rain the 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 rain to come in the clouds and the the wind to blow and to bring the rain. But sometimes the rain is not good, especially if there's flooding and you get more rain. But I'm assuming in this verse, it's, it's looking at it as a positive thing. Uh, 
And so let me look at that in the Amplified. It says, uh, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts falsely of gifts he does not give. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you're claiming that you're very generous and charitable and that you, you're giving a lot, giving things, and you didn't really do it, it's like clouds without rain. You know, what, what good is if you want the cloud to bring rain and there's no rain in it, that's like you saying you're giving, you gave some a gift, but there was really no gift at all. Hmm. Verse 15 in the KJV says, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and the soft tongue breaketh the bone. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, uh, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. <laughs> well, I, I think this verse here is a perfect example of why I need to go to the Amplified Translation or, or, or a uh, commentary or some, sometimes, or get some help because sometimes this old language, I just don't get it. But let's look at it in the KJV. It says, by patience and a calm spirit, a ruler may be persuaded. Okay, we can understand that. You know, if you're patient and you're calm and you want to explain the rule to a ruler or something, perhaps you can persuade him. And it says, and a soft and gentle tongue. So if you speak softly, uh, instead of raising your voice, being impatient, getting angry, it says, and a soft and gentle tongue breaks the bone of resistance. Okay, breaks the bone of resistance. Okay. So, all right, makes perfect sense. Now, uh, there's another... Uh, there's another verse. I'm not sure if this is in an epistle or if it's in Proverbs. I think it's in Proverbs. It says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. So if someone is, let's say someone is confronting you, they're real angry about something, they're raising their voice, and you see they're very angry, and if you remain calm and answer with a soft voice, it will calm them down instead of instead of you reacting with emotion and excitement and raising your voice uh, right back at them a soft answer and so this is saying a soft if you speak softly it breaks the bone of resistance so the fact that they they say they're resisting but if you speak softly and you're patient their resistance will break down and maybe they'll be persuaded yeah a lot of wisdom in that verse uh, verse 16, hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. <laughs> oh boy, every once in a while they throw out this vomiting in the scriptures. Like a, a, do a dog returns to his own vomit is an interesting verse. But uh, so uh, how are they taking this honey to be maybe something that's very rich and that you, you, you can't, you shouldn't overdo it. Let me look at it in Amplify, verse 16. It says, have you found pleasure sweet like honey? Eat only as much as you need. Otherwise, being filled excessively, you vomit it. Yeah, it's, it's just don't overdo a good thing, you know, you, if I... Uh, it's very easy when you find something, uh, it, whether it's um, rich food or drink or or even an activity, you, something that could be very good. If you if you get excessive, it ends up backfiring. Even see, I've <clears throat> I've tried to have good health habits my whole life. I'm 65, and uh, I might have missed 65 days of exercise my whole life. I mean, I exercise daily no matter what unless i just had brain surgery and i'm in the hospital for uh, you know, a couple of days i'm not exercising but uh 
even after back surgery in the hospital, I'm getting up and trying to walk around on a walk as much as possible. But my point is that exercise is a good thing. But you can even overdo a good thing. Sometimes if you overdo exercise, you end up wearing out part of your body from overuse. So uh, you have to be careful. Uh, We don't go to such an extreme with anything. Okay. Verse 17 in the KJV. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee. (laughs) Don't overstay your welcome. Verse 18. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Don't, Don't lie about about people. Verse 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in trouble, in time of trouble, is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Yeah, be careful who put your put your confidence in. Uh, and, you know, be a good. Hopefully, we can be a good judge of character. I'm sorry to tell you, I've been a bad judge of character many times in my life, and uh, I've had a lot of. <laughs> A lot of unfaithful friends out there. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. I have a friend that's more more faithful than a brother. So Jesus remains faithful. But our friends on YouTube, not so much. Um, As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon niter, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. Yeah, that's the point I was making earlier about saying something at the right time. And, and sometimes it's best don't say anything. Uh, if someone is grieving, you don't want to, you don't want to sing a song and have mirth and happiness and should be jovial. You need to identify and, and join them in their sorrow and their grief. Uh, verse 20, let me look at that in the Amplify. It says, like one who takes off a garment in cold weather, or like a reactive, useless mixture of vinegar on soda, is, is he who thoughtlessly sings joyful song to a heavy heart. If someone has a heavy heart, if someone's grieving, the best thing you can do is grieve with them and weep along with them. Verse 21 if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. Well, this could have been uh, come out of Jesus' mouth. But Proverbs by Solomon, let me see. This is about probably 900 to 1,000 years before Jesus. And this says, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. This reminds me also of what the Apostle Paul said, that uh, give your enemy food and drink, and and when when they're mean to you, you be nice to them, and it's like putting burning hot coals on their head. And that's, in other words, that will, they'll feel ashamed because they've mistreated you, and you've been kind to them, and then they feel ashamed of their bad behavior. So... Uh, again, verse 21, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And note it says, if thine enemy be hungry, it's not just a, a random person or one of your friends. I mean, if we're, Jesus said, if we're, if we're kind to our friends, I mean, what good is that? Even the heathen do that. Being kind to your enemies, loving your enemies. That's what, that's, that would be special to do something like that. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Okay, so I think now I'm seeing that Paul is quoting Proverbs. I never realized that before. That's really interesting because verse 21 and 22, Paul says in one of his epistles, and I thought it was Paul's words, and yet he's quoting Proverbs. So let me read it again. 
Let me read this in the Amplified, 21 and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, some people think coals of fire upon his head is, uh, you know, he will, uh, the, the, the Lord, you know, it says, uh, vengeance is the Lord's. Don't try to get vengeance for yourself. The Lord will, will give you, get vengeance on them. The Lord will punish them for their behavior. But I, I, I'm inclined to think that coals of fire is on their head is, is they feel ashamed. And I, I've seen that happen numerous times in my life when I've applied this verse that the people said, Brother Luke, I, I want to apologize. The things I said to you were really horrible. And then the way you responded was was so so nice. I just, I feel ashamed of what I, the way I treated you. And uh, all I did was apply this verse here. Let me see, there's a footnote here. Let me see, verse 22b, it says, uh, this expression may refer to an Egyptian, Egyptian custom in which a penitent man carries a pan of coals on his head as a sign of repentance. The message of these verses is the admonition to return good for evil in the hope that your enemy will be removed to repentance. Okay, in the hope that your enemy will be moved to repentance. That's what I was referring to when I said they feel ashamed and they, they repent and they, they, they change their mind and say, oh, I regret doing that. I'm ashamed of myself. Okay, back to the back to the KJV. Uh, verse 23, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Hmm. Wow. Let me read that in the Amplified. Verse 23, the north wind brings forth rain and a, back, and a backbiting tongue an angry countenance. So if you're have a backbiting tongue. If you're saying sarcastic, you know, things to people, uh, then don't expect them to be happy about it. They're going to have an angry countenance back at you. Verse 24. <laughs> I've always loved this verse here. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I love my wife and we've been married for 36 years now and uh, we get along great, but we've had a lot of arguments too over the years. And if there is strife, I know, boy, boy, you just got to get away from this uh, when you do have strife between you. And uh, <laughs> so I know that I know the feeling of this verse, uh, even though, uh, my wife could probably say the same back to me. Unless, so it says, uh, in, in the Amplified, it's phrased this way. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop on the flat roof exposed to the weather than in a house shared with a quarrelsome, contentious woman. Yeah. I think he says this again at some place, saying it's, it's better to live out in the wilderness alone than in a mansion with a, uh, you know, quarrelsome woman. Verse 25 in the KJV says, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Yeah. I think we'd all be real happy about getting some news. Uh, if you get good news from far away, if you, let's say you're, you're, you have family or friends of, of far away and perhaps you're worried about them, but you get a good report today that you're okay. I mean, it would be as cold waters to a thirsty soul. 26, a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubleth, as, is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Hmm. I have to see the amplified for that one. Like a muddied fountain and a polluted spring is a righteous man who yields and compromises his integrity before the wicked. Yeah. 
you know, we must not do that. That was, I mean, there's times for us to compromise in life, but we have to draw the line that compromising our, our, our beliefs, our integrity, our true convictions, you know, uh, it's necessary to compromise to get along in life with, with, uh, your spouse, with your friends and family, with everybody in the government. It, compromise can be good, but sometimes compromise cannot, you cannot be made if it's, if what is required is uh, uh, caving in on your core convictions or your integrity. Um, Verse 27, it is not good to eat uh, much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. It is not good to eat much honey, so for, 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 so for men to search for their own glory is not glory. Yeah. Uh, that's why, you know, I believe in the five solas of the Reformation. Not to be confused with being a Calvinist. I'm anti-Calvinist uh, a thousand percent. See my uh, playlist, Calvinism Debunked, if you want to know uh, how I feel about Calvinism and, and uh, you want to see the problems, the serious problems, and why it is despicable and wicked. <laughs> okay, don't get me started on Calvinism. But uh, when it talks about the five solas that came out of the Reformation period, uh, one of the solas is sola gloria, and that is only glory for the God. Sola, uh, uh, sola gloria deus. Uh, all, all the glory must go to God. We can't take any glory for ourselves and our salvation because salvation is unmerited. All the glory, all the credit, all the praise must go to our Savior Jesus, not us, because he did everything. And then he gives it to us. He gives salvation to us. No glory goes to the someone who receives a gift. All the glory goes to the giver of the gift. Uh, so men trying to get their own glory in any way, I think that's talking about not not about salvation, but just in general. In the Amplified, it says, it is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. That's right. All glory to God. 28, when the KJV says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In the Amplified, it says, like a city that is broken down and without walls, leaving it unprotected, so is a man who has no self-control over his spirit and sets himself up, up for trouble. Self-control. Well, I think I did a video on self, the word self. Uh, really, self-control. Uh, people think self-control is good. Self-esteem is good. Self-reliance is good. Self-confidence is good. But I, I say, no, that's all bad. See, uh, I don't want, uh, I, I don't want to have um, self-esteem. I want to esteem God. All this esteem, all the glory goes to God. Uh, Self-righteous? No. Uh, my righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Uh, the righteousness of Christ is, is what I value. That was imparted to me when I put my faith in Jesus. Uh, Self-control? No. I give. I want to give up control. And the Holy Spirit, guide me. Transform me. Uh, Self-confidence? No. I don't have any confidence in my own ability to work my way to heaven. I have confidence in my that Jesus will keep his promise and take me to heaven because I'm trusting him. So that's being Christ-centered rather than self-centered. So this verse here, whenever I see something about self, uh, self-control, uh, self-control means don't be out of control. 
don't be go crazy and be out of control. But when I see self control, uh, it automatically, I, I automatically think, well, I take it a step further and say, not only do we're not being out of control, uh, it, but and give control to the Holy Spirit, and and then uh, 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 in all my ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct my path. That's another one in Proverbs that I don't know if we've already had it or it's coming up. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. Uh, I'll pick up in the next chapter in the next study of Proverbs. Let me end the broadcast with a few minutes of telling you the good news. Uh, you've probably, uh, if you're already familiar with my studies, my, my channel and stuff, you already know all about this. But if you're new here, then maybe you're not aware of the word gospel. You've probably heard it over and over again in your life. That that's the gospel truth or you know, the gospels, you know, gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But truly the word gospel, what it really means, it literally translates to good news. And uh, I'm gonna, I've am i got some good news to tell you. <laughs> I really think though, instead of gospel being translated to good news, we should really say it's great news. It's the greatest news ever. And when I reveal this to you, when you learn this good news, if you understand it, and then if you believe it and accept it, you should jump for joy. It'll be better than winning that big lottery that there's a lottery out now for $500 million, I think, a Powerball or something going on. But I'd rather have what I'm going to tell you now than the $500 million Powerball victory because uh, that money can only be used for 70 years and you can't take it with you. And then, uh, but uh, what I'm gonna tell you is something that is a treasure forever, for eternity. So the gospel is the good news that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to you right now as a free gift from Jesus Christ. <laughs> so if you if you just just think about that. Salvation and eternal life in heaven. In other words, if after you die, do you want to go to heaven? Most people will say yes, but sometimes people say, no, I don't want to go to heaven. That's fine. If you don't want to go to heaven, then fine. You can just ignore this and you know you go to hell instead if that's what you want. But I've got news for you. The, the party in hell was canceled due to the fire. So you might want to reconsider. But if you do want to go to heaven, live forever in heaven with joy and bliss forever. And the joy will be beyond anything we could imagine. If, you, if, if that sounds good to you, I want you to know that's available to you. It's offered to you as a free gift from Jesus. Now, this is, if you're not familiar with biblical Christianity, if you're not familiar with the free gift theology, then this will sound totally foreign to you. And that's strange. That's weird. That's, that's, that's too good to be true. But what I'm telling you now is the Christianity you find in the Bible, not the Christianity you find in churches all over America. Almost all the churches in the world today, almost all of the, the philosophy of the world today, almost every person in the world today thinks that in order to go to heaven, it is determined by personal merit. You probably think that. If this is new to you, you probably you, your philosophy up to this point has probably always been, well, the good people get to go to heaven and the bad people don't go to heaven, they go to hell. And uh, that's, that's a philosophy from the devil. And it started in the Garden of Eden. That's right. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is when the philosophy was first, first learned and applied and accepted. Merit. You see, God told them there's two trees. There's a the tree of life. And 
that rep, that's a picture of Jesus Christ because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is life everlasting. And he's uh, the tree of life in the, in the respect that he died on the cross. He says he died on the tree. He was nailed to a tree. So the tree of life represents faith in Jesus, faith in God, reliance on God. And by the, through that means you have life everlasting. But the devil said, did God tell you that if you ate from that other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you would die? And Eve said, yeah, that's what he told us. But the devil said, well, that's not true. Uh, if you eat from that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not die. Instead, you'll understand good and evil. You'll know right and wrong. And then you'll be like God. And he bought it. She, she believed the devil. She didn't believe God. God said, you'll die. The devil said, oh, you'll be like God. You'll know right and wrong. So she decided to go that way, go her own way and figure that, well, if I know good and evil, if I know right and wrong, I can make my own decisions and I can... I can uh, accomplish whatever I want. I, mean, I, don't, I don't need God. I can do it my, my way. That's what people think. Almost all the people in the world today, almost all the people throughout all the history of the world have believed the same thing, that uh, they don't need God because they can do it on their own. They think, well, when God judges me, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? They'll say, well, I'm a good person. I mean, I, after all, I, uh, I did follow the, the golden rule. I even got baptized when I was a kid and I went to confession and communion. I attended church. I gave to charities. So I'm pretty good. That's why I should be in heaven. <laughs> but what they're doing is they're, they're appealing to uh, their own righteousness. They, they're trying to be justify themselves before God on based upon their own performance, their own conduct, their personal merit. But the Bible says, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. So you, you can't go to heaven through your works because the works that would be required of you the level of per you would have to attain would be perfection because the Bible says uh, that we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is perfect. So if the standard is the glory of God, perfection, and we go to church and we get religious and we do good things, we're struggling and trying to be good, but we'll always fall short. We'll never be perfect. If you, if you think you're going to go to heaven because of perfection, it's too late for you. You've already failed, just like me. We've all sinned. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, because of sin, you know, we can never reach perfection. And that's why we were, we're lost and we're doomed and we need to be saved. And that's why God said, I'll intervene on their behalf. I'll become a man. Jesus Christ. And what I'll do is I'll die for their sins. He died on the cross, paid for all of our sins. And he was buried. And on the third day, he raised himself to life. He did a resurrection of his body to prove that he is God and he does have power over life and death. He is our savior. So what I'm really asking you to do is, is simply do not have any faith in your own ability. Do not pay, put faith in, in your performance, in your goodness, in your religion. Reject all that. Instead, put all your faith in Jesus and trust him to get you to heaven. And see this icon right here? That's a picture of the fact that Bible says, 
Uh, God does not desire that any of us should perish. See, he's reaching down. He wants to lift you up and take you to heaven. And all that's required of you is trusting him to get you there. Don't trust in your own ability any longer. Reject that and say, I've sinned. I failed. I, I know I'm not perfect. I need a savior. And Jesus says he's the savior. He's the one and only savior. And the Bible says when he embraces you, he says, I hold you in the palm of my hand and no one can pluck you out. Once he has a hold on you, he's taking you to heaven no matter what. It's a promise. He promises you life everlasting in heaven once you put your faith in him. And because it's a promise from God, it's a guarantee. I'm guaranteed I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Do you want to be guaranteed you're going to heaven? Put your faith in Jesus and you can be certain. Thank you for watching, and I hope you will join me uh, nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time for these broadcasts. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.